Hi, it's Nero here from Investment Rise, and I know what you're thinking. How on earth can it be possible to be cheaper to own an investment property in 2020, especially in our biggest cities like Sydney and Melbourne, than it was back in 2010? I mean, we all know that prices have risen significantly from 2010 to 2020. So how on earth can it be cheaper to own property as an investor today than it was back 10 years ago? Well, that's exactly what I want to show you on this wonky whiteboard by going through an actual example uh, of, of a client of, of, of mine, right? And I want to go through the numbers in, in a little bit of detail here. So bear with me as we go through it, because I think if you can stick with me until the end of this, this video, you really start to see how numbers can give you a more accurate picture than almost anything else that, that you look at. So let, let's begin. Now, in 2010, a, a client of mine bought a property for a purchase price of $350,000. It was about $349 something, so I'm gonna round up to $350,000, okay? Now, uh, he and his wife, they borrowed 100% of, of the, the purchase price. So their interest rate, now at the time, the interest rate back in 2010 for, for them was 7%. Now, that might seem ridiculously high compared to you know, what our rates are today, but that's what they were 10, 10, 10 years ago, all right? And so on an interest-only loan, his annual interest payment, because he paid interest on the full $350,000, his annual interest payment was $24,500, all right? Now, the rent at, at the time he was getting was $370 per week. Now, that's an annual rent of and assuming no vacancy here. So in this example, I'm not gonna be talking about any of the additional costs, whether they're costs associated with buying the property, like stamp duty and, every, and everything else. And I'm also not gonna worry about things like vacancy and rates and property management commissions and, and, and every, everything else, all right? Because I think they'll only complicate things and you'll see that when I compare like with like, everything evens out in, in the end. So we, we're just looking at the annual rent here, gross rent, which was $19,240. Now. That was a yield of 5.5%. And yes, I do have these figures written down here already uh, just so that I'm gonna deliver them to you accurately. But imagine if you could find an investment property in Sydney or even in, in Melbourne that gave you a yield of 5.5%. You'd be doing cartwheels, right? You'd be, that'd be a very, very good, good result, okay? But if you, and I guess a lot of people get caught up in, on, on the yield and say, oh, look, I want a high yielding property. I want a yield of 5%, 6%, whatever the case happens to be. But let's look at the actual raw numbers here. You can see that the property uh, on the interest cost was $24,500. And the annual rent was $19,240, which therefore means their net annual cash flow was negative $5,260, all right? So that meant that the property was costing them $5,260. Now, we're not worrying about negative gearing here. We're not worrying about any depreciation. The property already at that time was about six or seven years old, so it lost most of its depreciation anyway. So we're just looking at the, at the raw numbers, all right? Now, let's fast forward 10 years to, to 2020, all right? So, 2020. Now. My client recently got their property valued, right, and the value valued at $720,000. Now that's a bank evaluation, which as I'm sure you know, is, they're often a little bit more conservative, which means that if, you, if my client was to actually sell this on the open uh, market, they could probably get more than that, but let's just assume that they, that's what they could sell it for, $720,000, because that's what the bank valued it at. All right, now, if my client and was to sell this property, for several twenty thousand dollars to on the open market, and someone bought it for that price, uh, and the the person who bought it again borrowed a hundred percent of the uh, the the purchase price uh, here as well. Well, today the interest rate is about three point two five percent. Now I know that you can get better than that, but let's just be be conservative. So looking at three point two two five percent. So therefore, their annual payments would be twenty three thousand. 
all right? Now, you can already see that's a little bit cheaper than the interest costs were 10 years ago, even though the property has risen by $370,000, all right? Which is some significant capital growth. In fact, over 100% of capital growth was what my client got. However, rent, we all know, have not kept up with, uh, with capital growth in, in, our, in our bigger city. So the rent today on this particular property that he's currently getting is $430 per week. Okay, so it's, it's increased, yes, maybe about tw uh, less, less, less than 20%, despite the fact that property has increased over 100% in, in value, all right? So that makes it a, so the annual rent then works out to be Again, assuming a zero vacancy, and we're not talking about any of the additional costs like property management commissions and, and rates and maintenance and everything else, exactly what we did over here. The annual uh, gross rent would be $22,360, okay? So that gives you a yield of 3.1%. So it's actually, and that's, mind you, pretty average for, for, for Sydney, so in 2020, the yield on, on the property is less than it was back in 2010, right? 3.1% in 2020, 5.5% in 2010. However, if you look at the actual numbers, the raw numbers, the net cash flow, so how much it costs my client to hold this property, again, we're not talking about negative gearing, we're not considering any of the um, property management costs, anything of that nature. If we just look at the interest cost being $23,400, and the annual growth rent being 22,360. What you can see here is that this particular property now costs my client, or if they were to sell it on, on the open market and someone was to, to, to get the property at this particular purchase price, it would cost them $1,040. So in other words, a property that has risen in value by over 100%, where rents have only increased by where we're we talking about maybe 20%, less than 20%, maybe 15%, yet the, it actually costs an investor $4,000 less on, on high level numbers to hold the property today than it did back 10 years ago. Now, of course, some of you might be thinking, yeah, well, you know, that's great. This is an interest only deal. Somewhere along the line, you're gonna have to pay back the, the principal. Somewhere along the, the, the line, this loan will have to be converted from interest only to, to principal and, and interest because we know back 10 years ago, you could have an interest only loan and when that interest only period expired, you just rolled over into another interest only period. You can't do that in 2020 anymore. So let's now look at, well, if it's interest only, I think you can see quite clearly it's cheaper to own and own and hold an investment property in 2020 than it was in 2010. But what happens if we convert this to principal and interest? So through the magic of, of editing, we now have a, a bit of a cleaner whiteboard. What I've got here is I've still got the, per, the, the prices of the, of the property. 2010, it was $350,000. 2020, $720,000. I've got the rents here as well. So I've got the uh, weekly rent of 370 per week, which it was in 2010. And then I've got the annual figure. Here I've got the weekly rent in 2020 being $430 per week and the annual figure. And I've kept the interest rates the, the, the same. So. In 2020, in 2020, we know it's uh, the interest rate is uh, probably going to be a lot lower than 3.25 percent because, as you know, in generally most banks these days they will give you a lower interest rate if you go for a principal and interest loan versus an interest only facility. But I'm just going to keep the interest rate the the, the same for, for for this for this example, okay? And in 2010, the interest rates for an interest only loan or a principal interest were essentially the, the same. So it stays at seven percent, okay? So let's go through the numbers. In 2010, if my client had taken out a principal and interest loan, their annual payments, principal interest at 7% would have been, or per month initially, it was $2,328.56, which works out to be $27,942.72 per annum. Okay, so now you can see that this property would have cost uh, my client, the net cash flow would have been negative 8,000, negative sign, $8,702.72. Again, we're not taking account any tax benefits here or anything else, we're just looking at the, 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 the raw numbers. Okay, now let's look over at, at, at in, in 2020. If, you were, if someone was to take out a a loan for the full purchase price, which is now $720,000, 
the interest rate, we're keeping it at 3.25%. And again, comparing like with like, we're looking at a 30 year loan term. The principal interest payments would have been $3,133.49 per month, which works out to be $37,601.88. Okay, so that means that now it's costing you, so it's a negative sign, $15,241.88. So it's costing someone on these numbers initially cash flow wise, it's an extra $6,539.88. In 2020 versus 2010. So now it looks like my argument is is gone, right? You know, I mean, if there's, if it's a higher negative cash flow in 2020 versus 2010, we're not taking into account uh, negative gearing or anything else, surely then it's more expensive uh, to uh, own a property in, in 2020. But there's one thing here we haven't considered, isn't there? Now, it's not negative gearing. As I said, we're not taking that into account. It's not depreciation because as I said, this property here was about six or seven years old at the time. So it had most of depreciation gone and 10 years later, it's 16, 17 years. So essentially very little, if any depreciation left. So what's missing for, from, 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 from this, this, this picture? Wage growth, right? Now, we all know, mind you, that in Australia over the last 10 years, wage growth has been negligible. I mean, depending on whichever report you read, you'll probably see an average wage growth per annum for the last decade of about anywhere from about 2.8 to 3.2% per year. So it's pretty much just inflation, okay? So wage growth hasn't really increased. However, what happens if we consider wage growth here? So let's look at the situation here from, again, my, my, my client at the time in 2010, his income, okay, single income, was $60,000, okay? now. As I said, the average wage growth, depending on which report you read, is anywhere from 2.8 to 3.2%. So let's be really conservative. Let's just say that it was 2% per annum uh, for, for the last uh, 10 years, right? And look, you, if you know, no one's gonna be happy with that, but let's just work on a 2% annual growth figure, okay? So that would mean that the income today is just based on 2%, okay? Compounding, obviously, the income today is $73,140, which is an increase of $13,140. Now, in, in 10 years, so that's about $1,314 a, a year, okay? So not a huge increase, but that's a $13,000 increase in, in income versus a property costing six and a half grand extra, which means the wage growth has actually been greater than the cost differential between these two figures, okay? So in other words, the property, yes, on a principal interest only, only loan, costs, the cash flow is worse for someone by six and a half thousand dollars, but assuming 2% income growth from 2010 to 2020, their household income has increased by $13,000, which means that they are still ahead which means that it's still cheaper to own property, or at least it's no more expensive to own an investment property in 2020 than 2010. Now, what's the point of all, all, these, all these numbers? Well, because there is no doubt at the moment that Australians have record levels of debt, right? Like, look at this example here. Someone's bought this property for $720,000, and I've said they've borrowed 100% of it. So that means their debt level is now nearly three quarters of a million dollars versus 10 years ago being 350 thousand dollars, right? So debts have, have almost doubled, but well, more than doubled in fact in, in, in this scenario, but wage growth, as people say, has only increased, well, 2% per annum. So even if you do some, you know, gross figures, that's about what, $12,000, 12, so about 20%, okay? 13,000, so just over 20% in 10 years. So debts have far outstripped wage growth. That's why so many people then will give you arguments that, oh, our debt levels are, are too high, uh, income growth hasn't, hasn't kept up. This is what uh, we saw the scenario being in Ireland or in the, in the US during the global financial crisis. So therefore, Australian property prices are going to crash. But the fact of the matter is that in Australia, we have a different situation. The numbers don't lie. And right now in 2020, it's actually cheaper to own an investment property than it was back 10 years ago. And so, 
that's really what I want you to take away from here is that I really don't see property getting much cheaper than it is already. If anything, I think we're at the seeing prices being the cheapest that they're ever going to be. And that with some of the other macroeconomic factors that I've, I've spoken about in, in an earlier video, I, I expect that we'll see interest rates actually start to fall because banks will drop in their, their interest rates. And even the Reserve Bank of Australia has said that they expect to keep the cash rate at 0.25% for at least the next three years. And that's only going to make this scenario even more ad ad advantageous. And then I think what you'll start to see is prices actually start to rise, even though Australia's in record debt levels, even though the rate of growth of debt is far greater than wages, as I've said in, said in this is example, our property market is still gonna be robust. This is one of the main reasons why, despite all those media headlines with people saying property prices back in March, April, were gonna drop 30%, 40%, whatever figure people are plucking out of the air, the fact of the matter is that according to CoreLogic, since March and, March and April, our property prices on average across all our major capital cities have, drop and have dropped just 3%, right? Now, 3% drop in price or 3% difference in price, well, you can get a value at today to go and value one property and a different value from the same valuation company can go and value the same property with a 3% differential. So 3% drop or 3% increase it's essentially irrelevant. What it proves is that our, our property markets are holding strong. Yes, some areas are falling, not due to uh, this scenario of debt being high, but rather due to supply and demand. So in other words, areas that are oversupplied, yes, they're struggling, but there are many areas where uh, properties are very deeply undersupplied and we're starting to see prices rise. And I expect that you're gonna see this continue for quite some time yet. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you found this video valuable and you're thinking you might like my help to help you find an investment property, then head on over to nerocall.com to discover our unique five-step process that's helped my private client group purchase now well over $66.2 million worth of property. And then if you like what you see, you can book in for a half hour phone consult with me personally. Either way, thanks again for watching.